Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the Football Grump. With me, as always, is Mike, the Cranky Fan. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, so we're going to get right into it. Top of the hour, breaking-ish news. Um, by the time you guys hear this, I mean, it'll be less than 24 hours news. So, mm -hmm. um, Kadarius Tony traded to the Kansas City Chiefs for their compensatory third round pick. So it'll be on the late end of the third round. It does not really matter too much how they finish. Uh, and a sixth round pick. So, wow. Wasn't <laughs> expecting that. Cranky fan, take it away. You know, you know I I have a lot of emotions about this one because, you know, some of you may know I went to Florida and, you know, I've been hyping Kadarius Tony pretty much since we drafted him that, you know, and he's a very complex person, a complex story, I guess, you know, someone who I feel like the narrative was set for him as opposed to him setting his own narrative. You know, we, we're not going to rehash, you know, the stories that came out of Florida. We're not going to rehash every little thing here, but he always felt like a guy where, led by the media in the very beginning, who might have started off with a, you know, a chip on their shoulder against Gettleman, didn't like the pick, did a tiny little bit of research, determined it didn't like him, and created the uh, the seeds for the giant fan, the vast majority of giant fans, not the ones who. Listen to podcasts and are, you know, the smart giant fans, the ones who just, you know, listen to the fan or read the back page of the post. And they planted the seeds already of this guy being a problem, you know, compound that by the fact that he he's been injured. He can't stay on the field. And it's just like he was pissing in the wind the entire time he was here. And, you know, my question is going to be is going to be why? I mean, do I really believe it's because he can't stay healthy? I don't know if I buy that. I I, I just don't. All right, so too, but before you yeah. get into it too much, yeah. I do want to recap what the injury history for this year because I'm going to ax off a little bit. I'm going to try my best yeah. to segment the Kadarius Tony story in between two coaching staffs here because yeah. – Dable and Shane did claim to give him a clean slate when they came in. I have every reason to believe that they actually did. They did the same with Daniel Jones, and we see how that's working out. So I'm going to try and separate that. So for this year, what we're dealing with injury-wise, he injured his right hamstring in training camp. Week two, he was playing. He did tweak that injury and has been pretty much gone ever since. He uh, – Ended up hurting his left hamstring October 5th, so that's around week four. He claims that was from, or someone claims that that's from trying to come back too soon at that time. Recently, he felt that he was ready to come back. It was the Giants that wanted to hold him back. Jordan Renan points out, and I don't know how much credibility this, I mean, this is a fact, but I don't know how much this went into them wanting to hold him back, but there is a stretch of, uh, after the buy of three games over 11 days. So I think they, or at least he postulates that they wanted him ready for that. So that's the injury history for this year. So uh, as you were saying, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. I, I mean, now I just lost my train of thought here. <laughs> so I okay, well, wait, the, the point you were making is that you had a hard time believing that he yeah. is this injured. That's why he can't get on the field. The point I'm making is that he felt that he was ready to come back very recently. And it was the giants that were holding him back. Exactly. And that, that was going to lead to my bigger point was the narratives that have been created, you know, either by the media or by fans who didn't like him was we are questioning his commitment to football and his commitment to playing. I mean, if this was somebody, this is on his fourth year and only plays three games a year for four years, and it seems like it's the same nagging injuries, I completely agree. We're talking about a guy that it's not even halfway through his second year. And, you know, yes, there's been injuries. That happens. But we're giving up on a talent that's potentially has potential all pro talent. I'm not saying he's an all pro receiver, but he has the potential for it. We've all seen. We've all seen his tape in Florida. We've seen him in that Dallas game last year. And we're just giving up on him just because of, he can't stay on the field physically? That, that doesn't make any sense to me. The narrative that he doesn't want to play football, he doesn't have the commitment, 
Jordan Radon, who last time I checked is not Kadarius Tony's spokesman or press representative, he's the one who came out with that story and said, you know, he wanted to play and the Giants didn't want him, you know, wanted to hold him back. I don't know what to believe right now with this coaching staff and how they're handling things because, again, week one, how many snaps did he have? Three, uh, four, five, six, around there? Well, he was part of that group of established starters, air quotes, established starters that really didn't have a role in the office. I mean, Darius Slayton only just recently started getting a role in this office. But Kenny Galladay also was not getting a big snap count at that time. Either. Well, that's where I'm going. That's where okay, I'm exactly going. Go ahead. Yep. It's like, okay, we're this offense is so unique and so different that arguably the two most talented receivers we have, and it's just as far as skill set, Galladay and, and Tony, we can't find a role for them to get on the field. I mean, these receivers we have are garbage right now still. I know some guys are starting to come back, but you know, if Darius Slayton is right now being like your go-to guy, that's a problem for your receiving core, and you can't find a way to get these on guys on the field to play when they're healthy. Okay, now I get it. Galladay got hurt, and Tony got hurt, but this is also we are in week six right now, which is or week seven, which is a whole different scenario than we thought week seven would be two months ago. We all assumed by week seven. You know, we would be out of it. We, 2022 would not be about making the playoffs or anything. It'd be about assessing this roster, de facto tanking for a better draft pick maybe. But guess what? This team now has legitimate playoff aspirations and maybe even further. They're only one game behind Philly, who's undefeated. I mean, they, they beat Philly or something. Who knows? So holding out, I, I just don't buy the, well, we're going to hold him out till he's really, really ready. I mean, these guys have to be really, really ready with the playbook, really, really ready physically to play. I, something doesn't make any sense. And it, I mean, also the other thing is, have, Grump, have you heard any stories that he was a cancer in the locker room, like his teammates didn't like him or anything? No, not yet. Not yet. But even before that fact, the point, you know, there was nothing had come out that he was just like a, you know, a bad guy or something. It, I just... You know, if, if they really want their own guys and they're trying to do this culture switch and everything, I, I can understand the thought process at the time. But right now, why would you do it now in the middle of a potential run, I guess? It, it, there's plenty of time, you know, this season could end up in the toilet. They can end up going seven and, you know, seven and nine or seven and ten for, you know, who knows? Then you make, you know, you can move on from a guy like him, but it seems like you're kind of a little bit self-sabotaging the potential for this season because the likelihood of replacing him on the roster, given the seal with the salary cap seems pretty low. So I would love for the full story to come out. We'll probably never get it, but I'm just left with a lot of questions about this whole thing. I don't know if I care. Well, I do because I'm trying to, I'm, we're learning about just coaching staff. We're learning about. The okay. Staff. All right. From a coaching staff standpoint, like, was this a good idea? Well, first of all, something you're not touching on is whether or not they were shopping him or heard an offer. That's possible. I so, mean, I mean, I, I, I think that that is something that is not being discussed when a lot of people have an immediate reaction to any trade, any trade, People are not thinking in, in their immediate reaction, were they shopping them or did they just hear an offer and thought it was best? I'm not saying that that did happen, but I'm trying to keep that in consideration. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a possibility. I mean, if they just, but here's the thing if they were offered something, that means that somebody else thinks there's a lot of value in this guy. Why yeah, but Andy, Re Andy Reid is also the guy who took Michael Vick. So that doesn't shock me in the slightest. Mm hmm. And also, um, just, I mean, other people probably could have given offers that were just not worth listening to. And this was one that they were like, mm, okay. I don't know. But, but again, you know, even if he's unavailable until December, let's say this hamstring just lingers on and on, no matter, despite what Kadarius Tony says. If, 
He still comes back December 1st. He is an addition and an asset to this offense, which we desperately, desperately need. And again, it's going to be next to impossible to get somebody for this season who can replace that potential. Why is that? Well, again, unless unless we are going to trade, you know, future draft picks in it and invest in the future, I guess, of what we can give up because we don't have any money just to sign anybody off the street, even with, you know, his money off the cap. Well, he, he's like nothing off the cap. He doesn't right, really so, help us. Cap. That's not a cap move at so all. So the only way you're really going to, you know. No, but what I'm saying is you can trade for somebody else on a rookie contract as there are guys out there like that. I guess, but they're not going to come cheap. I mean, we're going to have uh, as to far as what you up, have to give up. Uh, we're yeah, to give up future true. Draft picks. But but yeah, but you just got two draft picks that can be packaged up. That's true. And but, and again and again, using future draft. So this is another thing. If it's a player on a rookie contract, it kind of doesn't matter if you're using future draft picks because that's what future draft picks are for: rookies, people on small contracts, people that you do think you can use long term. Jerry Judy is essentially drafting it's drafting a somewhat more known quantity do you know what i'm saying it's mm-hmm. it's a bit of a reach but it's you can you can talk yourself into using draft picks for a known nfl quantity i'm i'm okay with that when it when they are on the young side when they're on a favor and like this is it's essentially getting a rookie he's on his rookie right, but, deal but the likelihood of making that deal I, I mean i don't know what denver wants i mean they're they're kind of sellers right now denver denver right yeah. Right, but I mean, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Lot, would you give up a? a, a... None of this <laughs> matters because I don't. I don't want to go down this road too much. I'm just saying it is possible. There is. There is still time. Well, everything there, is it, possible. Right. That's but unlikely. It, I think it's more likely that they because they got draft picks, because they got multiple picks in this trade. I do think it's more likely. Jordan Renan agrees. Other writers don't agree. They they think that this is an investment in the future. I think that it kind of opens up their options. They're willing to do more things. You know, we, we don't know. Like like I said, they could have been listening to offers knowing what what other teams were asking of them for players they wanted. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know what... But I guess... Maybe I they guess were already in discussions with Denver for Jerry Judy, Judy, found out what was needed, and was like, well, we're going to need probably at least a mid-round pick to deal with that, and then got this offer for Kadarius Tomey and... Saw, thought that they could swing it. You know what I mean? They're, these things can still happen. It's the day of the trade that we're talking about this. Yeah. So there is guess, still time. It, it is still too early to be like, in my opinion, to be freaking out. That's well, why I said I don't really care yet. It's not a freak out. It's just more of a... No, guess, you're not freaking out. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just asking... People make offers when they know someone's available. And I guess why... Incorrect. Too, they make inquiries. No, 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 no. They make inquiries all the time for numerous different reasons. This dude hasn't been playing. It is. This is a fair inquiry from anywhere. I don't. I don't think that this is what you're. What you just said is necessarily true here. Hmm. I don't know. I think if uh, you're more likely to make an inquiry, you're making inquiries if you think there's a chance for something to happen. Okay. Right? Fair. Go ahead. Do your point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that. I think this, you know, this front office, I think, made it known ar- around the league that they were will- more willing to listen to offers than other things. Like, somebody make make an offer for Evan Neal, and they're like, "Fuck off! Um, we're we're not discussing it. Period. End of story." But for some, why did Kadarius Tony all of a sudden who's only, you know, in game thirty of his career? I know he hasn't played thirty games, but if you're at his life cycle, it's his thirtieth game that they're willing to listen and then execute. A, a trade for something that even if it's to get a Jerry Judy, I mean, well, I mean, kinda, I, I know what, I know what you're Judy on your roster. I know what you're saying, but the answer yeah. to the question you just asked me is you don't hear about the offers they reject. You have no idea how many offers they got and for which players. I'm sure they got offers for Kenny Galladay. I haven't heard a peep though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there, but there, yeah. That's the answer to your question. So, I mean, yes, the trade was executed for Kadarius Tony. Yes, I do think that they thought he might be available because he has been sitting. And Giants fan base cannot be the only ones asking why he's not playing. I was asking it not that long ago. Mm-hmm. I, you know, 
my overall opinion here with the coaching staff and what what they want, I, I think that there's a disconnect there. I think they don't really like his attitude in general for the team. I don't think that they liked him when they were both in Buffalo. Both Shane and Dable, I think when they did their draft work, they were not happy with what they saw at that time. And it, it may have to do with media narratives, but it may not have to. It may be a personality vibe thing. Maybe they, they don't like his effort. They don't like what they're seeing. I have no idea. Yeah. But I think I think that they had their own draft scouting report because it's only a year old. He's been here for two years. That's it. So he's essentially a rookie as well. So I'm sure they remember just fine what their draft grade was on him. They came in here, gave him a clean slate, and lo and behold, he's still not ready. They got an offer. I, I Jordan Renan seems to indicate that they were holding him back for after the buy that tough stretch, which tells me that they were not actively shopping him, but that they were listening for offers. They may have oh, been, though. See, I look at it the opposite. To me, it's like they were holding him back so he wouldn't re-injure something in his, his uh, oh, trade that's, to zero. Well, that, that, so that's what I initially thought. What I'm saying is after reading Jordan's article, that's what he's indicating. Mm -hmm. So if that's what was the case, then... It's hard to say that they were – so both options are still on the table. They're, of course, being ambiguous about it. But to me, it doesn't really matter. He's an injured guy. He's not really helping the team right now in what they're doing. Of course he could, but he's not right now, and he hasn't yet. So I, I think they also had their pre-draft notions from their own scouting with him. They came in here, gave him a clean slate, and nothing's really changed from their point of view. And – they're at the trade deadline. They think they can get something because let's face it, man. Let's look at this team because now I'm going to get into the facts of this trade and get a little yeah. bit away from my feelings. Just a little bit. Yeah. Um, let's, the current team, we talk every week. There, I mean, there's a reason that there's the the, the lamest, the worst 6-1 and one team in, in NFL history. There's a reason that that started because this team has holes all the fuck over its place. Right now, this current team needs a center, a guard, two wide receivers at least, an inside linebacker, two corners at least. They also need a tight end. That's the minimum. Mm -hmm. Next year, by the way, they're going to have to deal with a quarterback problem, a running back problem, safety, punter, a corner yeah. again, another edge, another tight end, another wide receiver. And you're making my point a little bit about, you know, if, well, what you just, I, if you're I, trading for a receiver, you're going to have to take some of those draft picks that need to address all of these issues for something you potentially have on the roster already. Well, all I'm saying is that this is – whether they're using the – no, I, I still – it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whether they use the, the picks or not, it, 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 whatever the reason is, they have more picks because they have a lot of needs. Seriously. So mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter to me. They have a, a player that has not helped yet. And in return, they got help for the team. This is help for the team. Whether they use it in a trade, whether they use it in the draft, it's help for the team. And they've been thinking long term since they got here. We've been saying that. Now, I know that like they are currently on a run. The logistics favor them. And I literally just said and still believe that they have a coaching staff that can coach them to win any one game that they're in up until a championship game a conference championship. I said that. I still believe it if they can get there. So I understand the need to, to the the need for him to be here for a legitimate run, but it always was kind of just a bonus. So when you get an offer for something, you don't think it's going to fit. I don't know. I, I, I just... When were you really hoping on seeing Tony this year? I mean, at this point, now in the season he still hasn't played when were you thinking it was going to happen i was thinking it was going to happen after the bye probably in about two three weeks time worth and if i we didn't see him then i thought we weren't going to see him at all i thought he'd be ready to go for the stretch run so for me i initially had thought that and as we have gotten this far now where he still hasn't gotten off the side field and even joined in practice in any point I was starting to think that we weren't going to see him at, at all this year in any capacity. So that was already starting to creep into my mind. I obviously was still holding on to the after the buy thing, but that thought has already come to my mind that we may not see him at all at this point. He's still not even practicing. So, uh, you know, obviously he thinks he's better, whatever. But the, the reality was I hadn't was starting to lose my expectations 
for this year. So I but guess also, maybe that's why I care a little bit less. And here's the thing, too. It's like this is not the last year of the New York football Giants. <laughs> I mean, it's like even if he's a wasp for this year, you know, he's still an amazing talent. And then if he comes... If he doesn't play one down this year, spends the entire offseason, he's 100% healthy for next year, the offense next year is already better. because You're outside of your mind if you think that they would continue to hold on to him if he missed this entire year. What's he getting paid? Dude, it doesn't. They would be shopping him very actively at that point, and they would probably be at the point of cutting him. Because, Mm. I mean, he's not even their guy, and he missed the whole season? You're outside of your mind if you think that they're they're thinking that he's going to be part of any future they're building on at that point. Just outside of your mind. Well, if, I mean, if there's no trade value for him after this year, if he misses a whole other season, so and, then he's, cu- they would, and he's healthy next year, why would they cut him? We've seen teams cut, cut bait with players on rookie contracts very recently. Right, but I'm, but I'm saying, though, the whole point of cutting him would be he's unavailable, he can't play, he's still, he's, he's hurt, he's hurt, he's hurt. I'm saying... If they put him on IR and he's out for the year and he comes back in and, and off season he's 100 percent healthy from OTAs on. Now, if he decides he's going to go to, you know, the the voluntary workouts and stuff, that's a whole other story. But oh, you mean what happened this year? Yeah, yeah. If he comes in, in, back, in his clean slate year. Yeah. He's working out in a fucking backyard with his. By the way, his personal coach not helping him on Twitter. Not, not helping. No, no, no. I'm, just listen, shut saying, the fuck up. Like I'm saying, that's that that's an is, aside. Go on. I'm not. I, I'm not giving him the benefit of the doubt of all these things. Like it probably wouldn't have happened. But I think that if they got to the case where they just they put him on the shelf for the year and he did all the right things in off season and was healthy, I think he would finally he'd get one last shot. And if it, something went wrong again, he'd be gone sooner than, you know, as soon as he probably would just get cut. Well, look. We are, we are talking about this um, at length, and our we've I've been trying to avoid media narratives because I agree with mm-hmm. you, and we've also talked about it before, so whatever. But we're completely ignoring the fact that like, and, and we, I only just said it, but like he did start his clean slate off not well, no, nope. and, okay. and he did he didn't start his rookie year off very well. I don't think that he just. He's not good at giving first impressions. I'm not saying he's bad in the locker room, but I don't think he does well with authority or not not that he fights back, but I just, he just gives off an attitude that I think they have trouble dealing with. He's a pain in the ass to deal with, I think. And I, we we can't not mention that when we're talking about this. Do you you agree with that? I agree with that, but I also think that. It's definitely blown out of proportion. For, but also for a wide receiver room that is as bad as it is. I agree. I'm I agree. willing to have a little more tolerance. I mean, look at all the, the, the nonsense and the horseshit we dealt with with OBJ when he was uh, here. And, and those situations don't even compare. They really don't compare, right? Oh, well, obviously OBJ is a lot more accomplished guy, but... No, I, I mean in terms of the headache. Oh, I, OBJ... I... I, I we were in a, a, a chat with a bunch of, uh, you know, giant fans, and I brought this point up earlier. It's like, you know, Kadarius Tony did not sell out his quarterback on national TV, which to me was basically treason. He's not a guy that, you know, all these things that OBJ did. So the bottom line is, I, you're right. I just don't, you're right. The coaching staff just didn't want him on this team anymore. And I don't know how much of that was their own or just based on, preconceived notions and he's gone and you know and here's the other thing too is if he all of a sudden plays on sunday for kansas city and is fantastic for the rest of the year it doesn't matter because he's not on this team anymore <laughs> really yeah, I, I mean, it's I, gonna happen it's gonna happen every game like look at Kadarius, look what he did you know well and, you know what regardless regardless of how we feel this is this is a um Saquon Barkley draft pick moment for Joe Shane. Sure. Right? Do we agree? One hundred I mean, there this is this is going to split the fan base a little bit, definitely less, I think, than the Barkley one. Um but it's gonna split the fan base a little bit that and it's gonna be one of those long standing things because trades are not won and lost when they are made. It mm-hmm. is one and lo- they are won and lost when when the when the the investment pays off, you have no idea what you're gonna end up getting. So, um, 
it's going to be one that we're going to be hearing about year to year because we got two draft picks here. If they're drafted into players, we're going to get a draft grade on that. And then we're going to get the update two years down the line from that, whether those picks were busts or not. And whether Kadarius Tony does anything in Kansas City, maybe he is fantastic at the end of this year and we find out that Joe Shane is the worst ever and every fan hates him. And then next year, Kadarius Tony has hurt the whole year. We'll change but, our minds again. So we're going to be hearing about this shit for forever. So I, Yeah, I, and know. also one final thing with this is it kind of is not even what happens in the future with this trade, but it's also kind of an extension backwards for the Justin Fields trade. Right? Yeah. All right, moving forward, because we do have a game Thank to you. cover, but we have <laughs> other news, and it's relevant because we're going to talk a little bit about injuries, and uh, we have a lot of guys coming back. First and foremost, Nick Gates. Holy crap. Nick Gates actually being added to the roster. So he made but then that they didn't window. cut him because he wasn't helping the team for a year. <laughs> Sorry, being sarcastic. I mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, I, I, you know, I don't really – I don't know if he's going to contribute uh, in a starter fashion this year. But he's certainly not going to contribute immediately. But they wouldn't add him to the roster if they didn't think he was going to do something this year. So Yeah, I mean – we just spent time talking about they didn't want they wanted to hold some guy to who's completely ready, but they have this guy elevated to the to the uh, the active roster. So I think he's further along than we think he is, according to what the coaches perceive and how they want to use him. Yeah, well, well, that's what I mean. Like, if if he's gonna be like the the final backup for the offensive line, then I guess there's probably a different standard for that. Mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, I mean, they clearly think he's going to do something this year. They sorely need the help. They could definitely use his brain on that offensive line. They could definitely use his attitude on that offensive line. It would be great to see him back. I'm sure. still a little scared for him. Do you feel the same way? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think if anything in the last few years, with all the talk about concussions and all these different injuries is that, and also the fact that we're getting older, <laughs> we're not you know young kids anymore. It's like we realize these people are humans. And it's a very violent sport, and you do start to worry about, you know, repeated injuries and being putting yourself back in harm's way again. So, yeah, I, I definitely think about things like that. Um, also of note, we had three other players return to practice this week. For me, the guy I'm most excited to see, cornerback Rodarius Williams, who suffered an ACL injury last year. Um, and I guess like a setback in camp or something very mm -hmm. early on. So he, he was kind of shelved for a little bit and was on the short term IR, I think. Um, returned to practice today or yesterday. Um, I think, you know, in this system with Wink Martindale, the man coverage, utilizing speed first, I think that he can get on the field pretty quickly. I think so too. Yeah. And, and you know, Going into Patrick Graham's system last year, a system he wasn't even really perfect for. I guess it was what Graham wanted to run initially, but he he went into that lineup pretty fast. That surprised me then. So, um, But speaking of fast, the speedy Ellerson Smith is also coming back to practice. He had a foot injury. Um, we haven't seen him yet. I, I just It's a lot of hype with him, a lot of ceiling, but this is the kind of defense where you know I could see Wink Martindale using a guy like Ellerson Smith for something and making it work. Um, wasn't really looking so good in preseason, though, so my expectations are a little bit low. And lastly, Matt Pert, uh coming in, I guess, in the nick of time with Evan Neal suffering from that MCL injury. Uh, he had a late-season ACL injury. Mm -hmm. Someone brought up the point, like, hoping that maybe this coaching staff that has gotten the most out of its players can finally get something out of Matt Pert because – We've seen, you know, he's a he's a big guy with some decent technique, you know, in terms of athleticism and shit. He's just a, kind of a pansy. I, I, to me, I don't know that if just coach it that. doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't think that. You know, we joke about like Bobby Johnson calls his like O lineman dirt bags, and that's nothing about him screams dirt bag to me. No, no, and I think that's you can do all the motivational tools you want in the world, but if you don't have it in you, it doesn't matter. He, you are, just, you are. he doesn't have that dog in him. Mm -hmm. um, so going into this game, Seahawks, give me your thoughts. Tell me what you think about the Seahawks in general. I'm about as surprised about the Seahawks as I am, uh, quite honestly, about the Giants, how they've been playing this year. Aren't, aren't you? Like, 
you know, Seattle, the Jets, and the Giants, to me, are the three biggest surprises on the positive. I mean, did you think that Geno Smith had this in him? <laughs> that dog in him? <laughs> Um, <laughs> anything <laughs> you know what <laughs> you know what's funny this reminds me of the seahawks right at the beginning of their like surge that beast quake game you remember um who was the quarterback they had the free agent and then uh yeah, wilson but, but beat he, him out no, uh, no no it was before that it was before it was this pre-wilson this was they went to the Super Bowl or the, the Super Bowl. They went to the playoffs with a losing record or a 500 record or something like that, uh, because the NFC West was garbage. They beat the Saints at right. home with that, and it was like Charlie Whitehurst or something. Wow, who that? <laughs> someone like it, that. But yeah. it was Marshawn Lynch, and here mm-hmm. we have the the presumed washed veteran at quarterback who did show. In his game where he played for Eli Manning, they almost won that game. If you remember, that was a did tight ever, game that he did play. Did we ever think? Did we think he was washed or just never had a chance? Or was yeah, just, I eh. mean, it was just well, that's a yeah. I guess he wasn't washed, but yeah, just mm-hmm. maybe not ever in the right situation for him. Right. And now finally goes to an offense where he's got this, and here they have this running back and Kenneth Walker who's just breaking off these huge runs. This reminds me of that. I mean, I always had a bias against Geno Smith because I remember he had that one game against West Virginia where he had like 450 passing yards and five touchdowns. And for one week, he was like the Heisman leader. But still, in 2022, he's playing well. I watched a lot of that game last week. And, uh, you know, this is a game that it absolutely does scare me. I, 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 you know, I don't know if it's a trap game necessarily because it's a bye week next week, but... Going out to the West Coast, you now that crowd's going to be. We, we played them a couple of years ago. Different scenario than it is this year. I think I think the fan base out there is starting to feel this team, like kind of how the Giant fan base is feeling their team. That place is going to be loud. You know, we have a bunch of offensive linemen that are out, so let's see how they can handle the crowd noise. I mean, penalties have not been a problem with this team this year, but again, that place is louder than I think any other place in the in, in the NFL. Let's see how they can the, the discipline they have to not. You know, be, you know, false starting and, and putting this team in, in in tough situations. So yeah, you, I, you make you make a lot of really good points there. So, um, you're absolutely right in terms of the fan bases. I um always do podcast listening for opposition teams and just kind of get the pulse of things, get their insider thoughts because they look at their team the same way I look at my team, and that's exactly the kind of insight that I want. I don't want fluff. Um, and I want someone to be doing digging because they got nothing better to do with their lives. And, uh, man, they're like, I was listening to an insufferable podcast. Yeah, I, I'm not going to give the name, but like, Jesus, it was really annoying. And they are super amped up. Like they, they really think that something's moving here. And I don't necessarily disagree, but I'm, I'm just, you hit that right on the head and they are definitely going to be loud. It's like the loudest stadium on fucking planet. And they're going to come this is when they're going to come the hardest because they, they know they have to, just like Giants fans now, they're going to have to fight and claw for everything. And they are putting up points, dude. Oh, my God. I think they have like the they have like a top five scoring offense in the exactly. league. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, this, is, this is the best offense we face this year, don't, would you say? I, at this point, yeah, I would have to. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not the one that on paper scares you. Uh, especially, but I mean, we're going to see some stuff, but right now, Geno Smith is, let's, let's get with it. So Geno Smith is playing really, really well right now. He's Mm -hmm. playing in ways that I don't think any of us have really seen because he's incredibly accurate now. Um, Mm -hmm. but he's been good at throwing on the move. He's been making really wise running decisions. He's been extending the plays with his legs and this is what's really helping him. He's gotten really good at extending the plays with his legs and letting guys roam open. So he doesn't have to be pinpoint accurate. He can be just accurate. I mean, these guys are wide open sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, And now he's got the benefit of Kenneth Walker. I mean, they were already kind of leaning on the running game. Now they have like a real home run hitter hitting home runs. And I loved this kid in the draft. This was just not a running back draft for the Giants. So we didn't really get into it. But, you know, you just gave that little, you know, synopsis there. You could say the same thing about the Giants right now, almost with the. Daniel Jones, you know, extending plays with his legs, being a lot more accurate. No, I don't think Having, so. No, nope. you don't think so. 
I mean, though in in really really general terms, yes, but they're being utilized completely. I mean, Daniel Jones is a legitimate runner. Geno Smith is making wise de- decisions running, but like he's not going to put up 100 yards rushing anytime. That's not <laughs> happening. He's not being used in that fashion either. I mean, he's extending the plays with his legs in an improvised fashion that we don't normally see from Jones. Jones doesn't extend the plays, so, but he is good at escaping the pocket and running. Let me sidebar real quick. I, I don't want to go too far on a tangent here, but let's say okay. the Giants had you know, a, a normal wide receiver room. Do you think we'd be relying on Daniel Jones' legs as much as we are right now? No, we wouldn't be. Well, uh, yes, as part of the offense, yes. It's it would. It's always going to be a staple of it because, at the very least, they love the play action off of it, mm-hmm. and it works best for him. But that shit won't work if you don't run him. So it would always be. At, yes, it would take a lot away from him, um, but it's always going to be a part of the offense for him. I okay. Think. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think when you take that away from him, it it makes him shittier. Mm-hmm. It, like I think it hampers his passing game. I think it makes his passing game worse. Um, that was my because, point. But, yeah, because like the numbers, like you know, we know the hundred yards last week was an anomaly. That was you know he'd never done it before. You know, but just as a whole, like would we would we consider Daniel Jones a runner? Like you said earlier, yes. if we had more of a, of a of a passing threat. I still or, think he would be a runner, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a legitimate part of his game. I think okay. you have to look at him similarly to Lamar Jackson. Mm, interesting. It, okay. It, like, do you think that's ever not going to be part of Lamar Jackson's game? No, 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 no. That's that's. That's what I mean. I feel like he's more of a running quarterback than Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones can run and is a willing runner, but I feel like Lamar Jackson is more of a running quarterback. More of, but they're similar. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think Better you have to start. Yeah. It's it's time to start looking at Daniel Jones that way. Yeah, that's fair. Um, we got to talk about Kenneth Walker a little bit here because um, he's just playing lights out. He's flashed on the scene. He's going to be really, really difficult because we are already not good at stopping the run. That's mm-hmm. at this point. I know we focused on Lamar Jackson. Maybe we focused on Trevor Lawrence, but he's going to kind of force us to play. We're going to have to deal with passing, and we're going to have to deal with running, and we're not good at dealing with both at the same time, apparently. And he's going to make it really hard because he forces you to stay disciplined. He will just patiently sit and test gaps, and he can jump cut and immediately turn on the Jets. So even dumb shit that looks like you've got it bottled up for about two yards, he will force into a four or five-yard gain. That is not what this defense is good at handling. And I'm really worried about it because the added threat about that discipline is he will jump cut all the way outside. And if he breaks free, like the way Darnay Holmes let uh, ETN do last week, right. this game is over already. I can tell you right now. I am legitimately worried. I think your point on this potentially being a trap game looking ahead to the bye week is also legitimate. Um, but that's not to say that it's – not winnable because you know we're talking about this running game but it is a lot of kenneth walker doing things on his own so if they stay disciplined this offensive line kind of sucks charles cross their rookie at left tackle is playing pretty well uh, really well he's the rookie but he is still a rookie and he is still making mistakes but like abraham lucas their right tackle is kind of bad and they're asking a lot of him and we didn't see Aziz Ojolari on the injury report this week, did we? Mm-mm. So this may be the the first time we see the package of all four. Leonard Williams, Kayvon Thibodeau, Dexter Lawrence, and Aziz Ojolari for one full game. So mm. they can still do it here. But I more than anything, I'm worried about their offense, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, defensively... I think you know. I think we're going to be okay running plays. They they struggled really hard. If you watch the Saints game and the Cardinals game, they struggled with Taysom Hill and Kyler. I mean, Taysom Hill was just running the same. To me, I've never understood why defenses had so much trouble with Taysom Hill. Please tell me if I'm being stupid right now, okay? No, you're not. It really boggles my mind because more often than not, he just runs draw plays. I know he does other stuff. I know he can throw. I know you have to respect the throw. But his runs never seem like anything creative or interesting or scary, right? Am I crazy? Am I just not remembering? He just seems very good at doing the the routine. 
Like, yeah, I, I have no idea why he is so hard to defend. I, I'm not claiming to be a super smart guy. Maybe but... you're just worrying about all the other things that he does. And you just I, I guess so, but man, they just ran— It's hard to ran... be very good at everything, and you have to focus on one thing, and <laughs> maybe that's it. I guess so, but that, man, the Saints tore them up with Taysom Hill. I mean, he was running all over them. It's the same mm-hmm. play over and over again, and we saw that kind of work to the Giants' success last week. So— I have a feeling we're going to be able to score points in this game. Do you want to get to um, predictions here? You got anything you want to add? No, let's get to predictions. Uh, you want, it, want me to go first? I can go first. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think I think that this defense will rattle Geno a lot. I think that Wink Martindale is going to bring pressure that he hasn't really faced and doesn't do well dealing with. He is smart to pick it apart, though, so it's not going to be perfect. Um and I also think they're going to struggle handling Walker from hitting not necessarily the home run, but big chunk gain after big chunk gain and just being in short third down situations. Um, and I think the Giants are going to come out. They're going to put up points, but they're just not going to be able to manage the same pace. Um, and I think one thing we didn't talk about is Tariq Woolen, the rookie cornerback that they have, is just a turnover machine lately. But more than anything, I think that Tariq Woolen runs like a 4 40 or something like that. Oh. That really takes away from those Barkley plays that go for 60 yards. Mm-hmm. Now those are like 40, 38 yards. You don't have to take such a long of an angle to get him. You can, yeah, you can I mean, cut over. if he can really keep up pace, even from the other side of the field, it's going to be really difficult to get those home run shots and forget Daniel Jones running for 100 yards this week. I don't care. I'm not how predicting that again. They are. I no, mean, but... I think that they're going to run him a lot and I think they're going to utilize that. And But I. I, I they're not going to let him run all over the place. So I think that the the late game heroics they're just not going to happen this week. I think they lose something like 31-27 and this will actually be a really fun game to watch but a real heartbreaker for us all. You know, I was just looking at the schedule and I was looking at a map. You know, in the last 4 weeks, this team has traveled to London and back They've had to go to Jacksonville and back, and now they're going out west. I mean, the Giants have to be close to having the most air miles of any team in the league this year. And I think, you know, not having that buy immediately after London, well, I could see why they wanted to do that and kind of stretch out that bye week as long as they could to balance it out in the season. I think it's finally going to start taking its toll. I, I just think that, you know, another long, long flight, another time change, uh, and again, going into a very hostile environment. Um, I don't want to get into the, is this team for real or not. I think this team is playing well, but I don't think this team is deep and good enough yet to just to go in and say, well, they're going into Seattle and they're winning this game. I, I think that you know, being 5-1 and one is an amazing accomplishment, but we haven't had that eh game yet, you know. I think it happens this week. I think it's a victim of circumstance more than Seattle necessarily being better than the Giants. I think they're going to be – I'm going to see them coming out kind of sluggish. I think you're going to see, you know, one of those first halves where the Giants have like, you know, 19 plays for 75 yards or something low. I think that, I think they'll get their sea legs a little more later on as the game goes. But uh, I, I just feel that, like I said, it's a victim of their circumstance playing in this game – you know, I, I think this is because, again, like I said, lots of moving parts in this offensive line, crowd noise being difficult. You're going to see you know, an uptick in penalties, self-induced penalties, and we've seen earlier in the season. And I just think this is kind of a turd in the punch bowl this week. I, I think they're going to lose 31 to 14. And I think there'll be a little bit of an overreaction to, well, it's Cinderella and it's midnight. I think this is still a good team. They're playing very well for the talent level they have. I won't go overboard in thinking the end is near because they lose this game. And I think they go into the bye week. They get some rest. Coaching staff does some evaluations on some things. And they come out revving to go on the other side. Yeah, one thing we we didn't mention... um... Daniel Bellinger uh, suffered a broken face. We did kind of cover that. I think that's going to come back to bite them right Mm -hmm. now. I mean, like, I think they might be able to figure out a solution 
on how they want to handle that maybe with a Andre Miller, the guy that they got from Maine, but that's going to be down the line. I think mm-hmm. for this game, it's just too quick. They don't have a solution for it. And he was a real chain mover. He was a real help in the blocking. I think that's going to hurt them a lot right away. <laughs> um, yeah, I, agree. I have no, I, I have no idea with Andre Miller what he's going to add or take away, if he's going to be able to fill that role, be something that they really invest in. They seem to like him a lot early on, but whatever it is, I don't think he's going to be able to do it right right away mm-hmm. that's um, why i think that bye week's going to be important i think they need to yeah i mean they're hurt man i mean it doesn't look like evan neal is going to play and yeah. the backup tyree phillips is not feeling so great himself well, he practiced see, only in a limited fashion didn't we see evan neal's out could be three to four weeks something like that it's an it's a yeah. grade two mcl we talked yeah. about it on the last episode yeah so i mean like the giants are hurt they're tired. They racked up the air miles, like you said. It's not that they're a bad team. It's just that Seattle right now is hot and on the move the way this, we were three weeks ago. We're just getting NFL. tired and need rest. That's this it. This is the NFL. Watch every single week. You know, it's not the good teams don't always beat the teams that aren't as good as them and vice versa. So it's okay if they lose this game. I mean, Jesus. No, it's never okay. <laughs> you know what I mean. No, it's, I mean, this is all going to be Kadarius Tony's fault anyway. So <laughs> it's that trade two years ago for the. <laughs> I um. God, I just. I've never like wanted to be on Giants Twitter less than today. It's it like I wanted to be on Twitter to get the information, and I just had to scroll past like toxicity. <laughs> it's just like. I don't care right there, now. There was just a lot of told you so's, and it was just like, you know, we've always. Talked I, I about just thought a lot of fighting and just arguing. I just don't. Uh, I just. I just want to get past these next couple days, um, but that won't happen anytime soon. Anyway, we're gonna move forward yeah. to other other predictions here. We're gonna head over to around the NFC East. Washington versus Indianapolis. They'll be hosting them. Indianapolis is a really weird team. I can't figure it out. I have no idea if they're about to get better, get worse, or continue being a complete mystery. But Washington seems to be getting something together with Taylor Heineke, while Indianapolis seems to be falling apart. I'm going Washington here. I'm going Indy. I still think Washington sucks. I I don't know what's going on with Green Bay right now. I don't think anybody knows. Um, And again, like I just said, the NFL is a fluky league where anybody can beat anybody. I think... That was the anybody can beat anybody situation last week. Um, let me ask you something: Is has your opinion changed at all after because of the, the Green Bay win since they've lost to the Jets and Washington since about us? No, uh, because I don't Agreed. know. Well, I don't know when this stopped, but it used to be a thing where people would claim to break teams. Do you remember, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but it's like, oh, so and so broke the Packers. Like this would be like the Giants broke the Packers. We're the ones who figured them out and just dismantled them, and now everybody else is able to screw them up. They're all messed up. That used to be a thing that people bragged about. I guess so. so. No, I, my my yeah. opinion hasn't changed. It's still Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I there's pre- clearly something wrong, but I'm still I'm not. I, I don't shy. I was trying to debunk the narrative that was going around of like, well, how. How impressive really was it beating Green Bay because they've since lost each other? Not to me. I mean, no, that was, not they, to me. I mean, I, I mean, we've had our sidebar conversations like, "Yo, does Green Bay suck?" Uh, but that never came up between us. You know, whether that made me feel better or worse about it, I don't care. Yeah. Um, Agreed. Dallas is hosting Chicago. I'm gonna go. This is this is my bold pick here. I think Dallas loses. <laughs> Reasoning? I don't know what the fuck was happening against Detroit, but they were playing like absolute dog shit garbage in that game up until like the middle of the third quarter. Things fell apart. And Detroit, I don't even – the score, they basically hand literally handed right. the game to them. I mean quite <laughs> literally handed the ball to another player uh, in, in like the final quarter and a half. Chicago – I don't know, man. I, I think something's wrong with Dallas. I think I think something is not right with Dak there. I mean, th- th- he was turning the ball over left and right. I My gut instinct is he's probably not fully ready to be playing, and I think the owner really wants him to play. And 
I have no idea, but I wonder if that locker room is a little split now and who the That's quarterback That's what I'm be. thinking, man. I'm thinking literally exactly what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You know, I and I don't even think it's even a question of well, Dak is getting this has this huge contract. I have to play the money guy. It's just you know how Jerry Jones is. You know, when you're his guy, you're his guy. And we all know he is the most hands-on owner in this league. And I think that's causing uh, some Robert issues. Kraft. Yeah, Robert Kraft's not the GM. It was, a, it was. Oh, yeah, true. It was a hand job joke, though. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so who's your prediction? Who is it going to be? <laughs> um, in spite of, you know, what we might perceive as internal turmoil with Dallas... And even the fact I said last week they really haven't impressed me much, even though they've been playing with a backup quarterback, I still think they're better than, than Detroit. And I think they got their their half out of the way of being you know, mediocre. I think they win this. That was the more logical answer. Yeah. I, I want this to be true. And I think, oh, that, I, think that, I think there's a little bit of something to what I'm saying. So I'm running I think there's a little it. bit of something. And I think if they were playing a team other than Chicago, I would you – know, if they were playing the Giants this week, I'd be like, hmm – yeah, okay. I'd be more inclined to pick us to beat them, but I guess it, you know, one of the dregs. Yeah. Um, the battle for the Keystone State, the North's least liked state. Um, Philadelphia <laughs> is hosting Pittsburgh. I didn't want to the, make a bunch of enemies on this show or with my co-host, by my opinion, but. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, you you think New Jersey's? Yeah, maybe. At least there's stuff going on in New Jersey. I love you guys in Jersey, even though. Sorry, snacks. The pizza isn't as good. Oh, uh, that's, anyway, that's a separate, that's this, is, a separate this, is, <laughs> this is Philly all the way, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. I don't even know if this warrants discussion. I, I, I like Kenny Pickett for Pittsburgh, too. but you know, I do, but not yeah, in, in the future, but not right now. Not against this team. All right. It is a big college weekend, so we are going to give one game each here. It is the big rivals weekend. I am going to be watching Penn State, Ohio State. Um, I have avoided a lot of Ohio State, but this is the game to watch C.J. Stroud because it's against a good team. Ohio State doesn't play a lot of those. Um, But there's a lot to like here. I mean, Penn State, I've already watched a little bit of. Giants need wide receivers. Parker Washington, 388 yards and a touchdown. Mitchell Tinsley, the guy that came over from West Kentucky, 340 yards and four touchdowns. I mean, Parker Washington is more of your slot guy. Um, the five ten type, so maybe he's not really in the Giants' eye with Wondell Robinson being the main guy, but maybe they like having two guys like that. I don't know. But Mitchell Tinsley is much more, you know, the six one guy. He's gonna jump up and get him. And on the defensive side, Jair Brown, safety for Penn State, is three picks already this year, three pass breakups, a sack, and forty one tackles. Oh my God. <laughs> CJ Stroud, you are meeting your match. And on the flip side, I mean, same story. We've got CJ Stroud, obviously. I'm going to see him in a real situation playing against a tougher defense. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr., nearly 600 yards and 10 touchdowns. Another wide receiver you can't take your eyes off of. He's going to have his matchup with cornerback Joey Porter, maybe. That would be an interesting matchup to watch. Um, and, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba might be playing this game, maybe on a pitch count. So get a good look at him. You're going to be watching what, Florida, Georgia? Yeah, you know, Grump, for 20 years, I'd go down every year to Jacksonville for the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. And two things always happened. I drank like a fish, and Florida would beat Georgia. Now that I'm old and my ticker is not what it used to be. I can't really drink anymore. I will not be partaking in the booze, and I will not be watching Florida beat Georgia, unfortunately. This is going to be ugly. I am have to take it like a man. Um, but I am going to see a lot of NFL talent on the field. Georgia, you know, you can argue, is now a better recruiting machine than Alabama is, and you saw all the guys... I mean, how many guys did they have on their defense drafted last year? Like nine or ten? It was ridiculous. And they just There's something crazy running. high. It might have even been like eleven or twelve. Yeah. So, you know, Ringo, the cornerback, is obviously who everybody's excited about. But the matchup, what I want to see, I want to see uh, Jalen Carter, the defensive tackle. Um, the Gators, the one thing they do have going for them is they have a really good offensive line, especially. 
uh, run blocking. Um, I want to see Jalen Carter, you know, in person, how he does against a, a, a much better than average offensive line and see if he's, you know, for real. Again, do the Giants necessarily need a defensive tackle right now? Probably not. But, you know, as far as, you know, looking at big prospects in the NFL, this is a guy I want to see. And obviously Ringo I'll be paying attention to as well. Um, you know, I'm not sure if the um, – the good Gator passing offense, or the the Anthony good the good Anthony Richardson passing offense will be there, or the bad one will be. He was absolutely dreadful last year against Georgia, although he was thrown out to start, you know, not given any opportunities for success. Um, but let's see. I want to see what Ringo does in person as well, because he cornerback is a position we may be looking at, and you know, again, the more we win, the more we keep sliding down the potential draft board. So. He may not even be available by the time we were drafting, but uh, other guys, you know, that Georgia has a ton of good tight ends. Um, Darno Washington is a guy to watch. Um, he will probably have a, all the tight ends that Georgia have will probably have a field day against Florida because we cannot defend a tight end to save our lives. You know, if you watch a Florida game, you're basically watching a giant game. Um, so you might see some, you know, pretty gaudy numbers from him, even though they have a very average quarterback in Stetson Bennett. And Darnold uh, so, Washington's like six seven too. He is yeah, so massive. Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, when you watch a Georgia game, you're just seeing tons of talent. And um, if I was watching this as a non-biased person, I'd be very excited to see them. However, I will be up nonstop for the next four days in fear that we get run out of the stadium very badly. So do you think Jalen Carter is going to be ending up uh, matched up with Osiris Torrance at all? Um, it could be, I mean, Torrance is, um, Osiris Torrance has been banged up a little bit. He should be back for this game. The Gators, okay. had a bye, they had a bye week last week. So even if he's playing, he may not be at a hundred percent. Okay. And, and the Gators have done a really good job. They've had a couple of injuries, the right? The right tackle and right guard, you know, Osiris Torrance, they both had some injuries this year, and they plugged in guys who played really well. But oh, you're okay. going up against significant NFL talent. Yeah. All right, everyone. So you got our predictions for the game. You got our college weekend. That is going to be our Friday wrap-up, and we will see you after the game. That's Sunday at 425. We will be, you know, I'm sure on Twitter and stuff because this is an away game. I'm at football underscore grump. He's at the cranky fan. This show, of course, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, it's there. And of course, video on YouTube. So we will see you all after the game, Tuesday morning. Till then, go Giants. Go Giants.